reading, writing, and reefer. Well, I was walking home and a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to go smoke a joint, so I said, yeah, and we went over to his house and smoked a joint. What'd you do after that? Then we had decided to come over here, but it was raining, so we just waited till it stopped, and then we came over here, and he smoked a joint with me and my brother. You still high? Yeah, a little. Feel good? Yeah. A 12-year-old schoolboy stoned on reefer, marijuana. For years, we have debated the legal and medical ramifications of marijuana smoking. But for the most part, we've talked about adults. All our medical research has been done on adults. This report is not about adults, and it is not about the occasional use of marijuana. It is about chronic marijuana smoking by American youngsters. Suddenly, in just the past few years, hundreds of thousands of American youngsters have become daily marijuana smokers. Not experimenters, not occasional users, but chronic smokers. In their own words, potheads. They smoke not just at weekend rock concerts. They smoke every day. And not just teenagers, but children. They are smoking reefer with a frequency and in ways that are potentially disastrous. How many joints I was smoking was about 100 a week. 100 joints a week? Mm -hmm. It's about 10 a day, a little more. And usually a large group that I know that I'm friendly with smokes in the morning, smokes in the afternoon, and smokes at night. And any time in between there, too. To support a habit, this extensive, where do these kids get the money? They work for it. Some take it from their bar mitts for a confirmation money. Some deal for it. I like when I get up in the morning, I like to smoke one, or after I eat, I kind of like to smoke one then, or, or just when there's a bunch of people around, that's when I really like to smoke pot. What effect do you think smoking marijuana has on your work at school? Not too good of effect, because when you smoke marijuana, it just, you just don't feel like doing work right then. You don't feel like even getting into it at all, listening or nothing. It just makes it seem like a drag. It makes you feel like you're in a dream. It's not normal, and it's not too active. You're just in between, just right. Brian lives in Florida, but there are children like Brian in almost every American city. Children who, even before they enter high school, have become veteran marijuana users. How old were you when you started smoking regular? About eight and a half, nine. How often do you uh, get stoned? Almost every day. How does it make you feel? Good. I just feel relaxed, you know. Just like to sit there and watch TV or do something. Could you tell us about your smoking habits? When do you light up your first joint? Well, on the weekends when I first get up after a while, I just smoke a couple joints to get off, and then I just wait a while, and then after I've gone down and I smoke some more. And on weekdays, I usually don't smoke in the morning, but sometimes I buy a couple joints and go up to the bus stop, and we match each other. But it's usually I just wait till after school and come home and get high with my brother and stuff. Uh, do many of your friends smoke at school? Yeah, almost all of them. About 20% don't. What grade are you going to be in this year? Eight. Like most of the children you will meet in this report, Brian lives in a pleasant neighborhood. He is not a deprived child, he is not a delinquent, he does not like alcohol, tobacco, or PCP. Smoking marijuana, toking they call it, is what he and his friends prefer. And their entire lives have come to revolve around what they call copping a buzz. How many joints do you smoke a day? Around five. Five. 
sometimes more because sometimes like there's a party Friday night or something we just smoke almost our whole bag say when you say you smoke five joints by yourself no with friends like just friends of mine how many joints does it take you to get high probably just about a half a joint not even that much it's about three four tokes and i've got copped a buzz and how long does the buzz last mm, about an hour and then you toke up again yeah i just take like three or four more tokes and then just put it out and save it for after a while often by the time brian boards the morning school bus he and some friends have shared their first joint sometimes they decide not to go to school in one nine-week period last year, Brian skipped school 16 days without his mother's knowledge. He spent those days stoned on marijuana. There was a time when Brian was an excellent student, interested in school. That has changed. I just feel good getting high in the morning at first, but then after a while, I just get real tired and fall asleep in class and stuff. I feel it has made him sort of forgetful and just not really caring like he used to, but now that I realize that he smoked some before school, now I can really see why his grades have gone down. What happens if you're sitting in a classroom high and a teacher is giving a lecture? I just sit there. I listen, but I, I don't remember it after she said it. Say so she said something and she'll call on me to answer the question. I'll say, what? What? They are using it often, every day and many times throughout the day. And uh, I, to be honest, didn't even uh, realize how often my own son was using it till this interview. Experts like Dr. Robert DuPont believe that many adults are not aware of the extent of their children's smoking. No, uh, they're not. And I think this is a very sad uh, fact. Uh, over the age of 25, the levels of marijuana use fall very dramatically, and over 30, they fall to practically zero uh, in, the, in the total population. So that people who are adults don't see very much marijuana use and are utterly unaware of both the extent of it and the rapid increases that are going on in marijuana use. Uh, I see it going on all over the country right now, involving uh, schools, involving parents, everybody. People don't want to see the problem. They don't understand it. Um, you know, they try really hard to understand it, but they don't know what's going on, and it's hitting them really hard, you know. What is going on? Their kids are out getting high. Dr. Johnston, your annual surveys of American high school seniors show a steady rise in the number of students who are daily habitual smokers of marijuana. Is that trend continuing? What, what do your 1978 figures show? Yes, it is continuing. We're finding that uh, among the most recent high school class, 1978 seniors, that about 11% are reporting daily or near daily marijuana use. And this figure is up considerably from an earlier class, 1975, where the comparable number was about 6%. So the number of daily users has nearly doubled in three years. What that University of Michigan study means is that nationwide, 11% of all American high school seniors were smoking marijuana every day. Those are just high school seniors. An official government report says that in 1977, more than 4 million young Americans, ages 12 to 17, were what the report called current users of marijuana. It's no longer uncommon for 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and even younger people to be using marijuana on a regular basis. I think it's important that during this same period where we've been observing a constant increase in marijuana use, the proportion of young people who are involved with other illicit drugs has remained very stable, almost exactly where it has been over the last four years. Lisa is 15 now but she has been smoking marijuana for a long time. When did you start smoking regularly? Um, in the seventh grade. How much did you smoke? Um, about four or five joints a day. How long have you been smoking four or five joints a day? Three years. 
What effect did it have on you? I like pie. <laughs> what was it about marijuana that, that made it so important to your life? Um, when you uh, get high, you uh, mellow out a lot. Um, you forget about your problems, school, tensions. Do many of the kids smoke as much as you do? Mm-hmm. Chris attends the same high school as Lisa in a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. He became a marijuana user at age 11. Now he's 15 and a heavy marijuana smoker. Well, when I don't have it, it depends on how many people, you know, front it to me or whatever you want to call it. Like, when I don't have it, I smoke between 10 and 15 a week, not including Friday nights and Saturday nights. And then when I got it, I smoked twice that much. You smoke 30 joints a week if you have a bag of your own? If I got a bag of my own, it's usually gone in two hours. Why do you smoke that much? What do you get out of it? You just like the high. Yeah, it's nice. It's a nice feeling. You can sit back and relax and listen to the music and have your fun. Like you smoke your first joint, and if you've been smoking it a long time, then you get kind of, you get your buzz, you know, going. And that's when you just, your head's kind of like, it's just barely on the tip where you want more, you know. And then when, by the time you smoke the second joint, you'll be high, and then you're just like, you're relaxed, and you don't let nothing bother you, and nothing ever bothers you. When you, like when you're normal, every little thing, you know, could bother you, but like, when you're high, you just, you don't let nothing bother you, you let it pass by. Seriously, how has it affected your grades? Uh, well, my grades were all right till I hit the seventh grade, and that's when I started getting high, too. Um, the highs are more important than the grades, more or less. What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't really know. <laughs> I had no idea. Just but you want to be a marijuana smoker? Yeah. Whatever it is. I know I'm going to be that. ...his father's room and killed his father with the axe. And then, when his mother stirred in her sleep, he killed her with the axe. These are scenes from the anti-marijuana film Reefer Madness, released in 1936. The demons of marijuana were not satisfied. He went from there into his brother's room and killed his brother. In those days, marijuana was called the devil's weed. Films portrayed marijuana as the certain cause of murder, insanity, and sexual depravity. With publicity like this, it's not surprising that by 1937, marijuana was illegal in America. But the anti-marijuana propaganda was so distorted and heavy-handed that it produced a backlash. There was so much exaggeration of the evils of the drug that many people stopped believing any bad news about marijuana. That skepticism is still with us. And it's one reason that today's young pot smokers are reluctant to believe that marijuana is anything but a harmless herb. That attitude is encouraged by advertisements like this one, suggesting that Uncle Sam wants you to smoke marijuana through a water pipe, or what potheads call a bong. Peddling the paraphernalia of marijuana smoking has become a quarter of a billion dollar industry. Much of the advertising seems to be aimed at young people, like the space pistols, designed not for games, but to squirt marijuana smoke into the lungs. And there's a frisbee called Catch a Buzz. It has a built-in pipe for smoking marijuana between tosses. Milk and cookies are used as a background to pitch rolling paper. These days, not many Americans roll their own tobacco cigarettes, but a lot of people, including children, roll joints. The rolling paper comes in strawberry and banana flavors. All of these advertisements appear in High Times Magazine, a publication aimed at the American drug culture. Many youngsters told us they got most of their news about marijuana from High Times. And from such a source, they are not likely to get much adverse information about the drug. The implication of some advertisements is that reefer is good for everybody, regardless of age. Some young people have come to believe that. Like a friend of mine, uh, they have a kid, and uh, 
He gets high even one night we got him high. Uh, he's about two or three. How do you get a two or three year old child high? You just teach him how to toke and he tokes it. <laughs> then he starts getting red eyed, then you know he's high. How did he act? Then he starts jumping around. <laughs> do you ever think that regular marijuana smoking, the kind of smoking you do, and the kind of smoking your friends do, 10, 20, 30 joints a week, might turn out to be harmful to your health? No, I don't have it. I don't have a doubt in my mind, you know, that it'll hurt me. It won't never hurt me, I know. No, I don't really think it could harm you. And I don't really think it does nothing to your body except, you know, sometimes make you just feel like a statue or something. Not really like that, but where you don't want to move. Young pot smokers are fond of praising the pleasures of the simple weed. Marijuana is a weed, but it contains over 300 chemicals. 60 of those chemicals are found in no other plant. The most potent of them is called THC. THC is the major intoxicating element in marijuana, which this is, grown in a government laboratory. THC is what makes the pot smoker feel high. Now, the THC content and therefore the potency of marijuana can be increased by selective cultivation. And that is happening. On the average, the marijuana available in our streets and schoolyards has become more than 10 times stronger in just the past four years. Now, potheads like this so-called good material, but it means that just as our children are taking up chronic pot smoking at a younger age, the chemical content of the marijuana they're smoking is growing stronger and stronger. When the pot smoker uses that good material, the smoke carries a variety of chemical compounds to the lungs. Within seconds, the THC begins to circulate throughout the body, carried by the fatty particles in the bloodstream. Almost instantly, there is an effect on the brain. As with alcohol, the human thought process is chemically altered. This state of intoxication is what getting stoned is all about. Along with the intoxication, the heartbeat increases dramatically. This is why many scientists believe that no one with a heart condition should use marijuana. Unlike alcohol, the THC from marijuana remains in the body for a long time. Up to three days after you've smoked a joint, half the THC is still in your body, where it tends to accumulate in the reproductive system, the brain, and other vital organs. Just how long the last traces of THC remain in the body, no one knows. The more you smoke, the greater the accumulation. That may be one reason that heavy smokers seem to develop a tolerance. They have to smoke more marijuana or stronger marijuana in order to feel high. But what concerns scientists are the potential long-term effects of THC accumulating in the vital organs. No one knows what those effects will be, but many scientists are particularly concerned about the chronic use of marijuana during the formative years of childhood and adolescence. Dr. Sidney Cohen of UCLA is among them. Dr. Cohen, are you more concerned about marijuana use by young people than you are about marijuana use by adults? Yes, I am, and, and for, especially for the following reason. Not only do they have longer periods of time to be exposed to marijuana and therefore possibly harmed by it. But youth is a time of learning how to deal with life, how to cope, how to uh, deal with stress, how to manage anxiety. If you don't learn it then, when do you learn it? Are you saying then that marijuana would stand in the way of young people going from adolescence to adulthood? To psychological uh, adulthood, yes. And, and this can be dangerous. Uh, and, and this is why I'm particularly concerned about very young people. And we're hearing now of eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds becoming over-involved in this drug. Young people themselves are discovering at least one effect of chronic smoking. They call it being burned out. The first symptoms are a drastic change in the way marijuana makes you feel. When I first started getting high, I'd be laughing and everything. 
But lately, you know, I just get kind of mellowed out and I don't say much, I become real quiet and everything. And um, I don't know if the high, I'm, I guess I'm kind of sick of the high. Well, usually a new smoker, you know, is real active, tries to make everyone laugh at them, and is always talking and moving around doing something. But the people who've already smoked are burnout. out. They just like to sit around, watch TV, or they don't like to do much. What stage are you in? Just sitting around stage. I don't do much. I just sit around, fix something to eat. It just makes me drowsy and just just like to sit there and not move. Say I'm thirsty, I can't, I'm just so plumped out, I don't even want to go get something to drink. You are high, but you don't consider it as high. You know, you're, it's just another thing. And you'd have to smoke more of it once you, you smoked it a while than you would if you have just started smoking it. Like, instead of one joint, it'd take two or three joints. So. Is that why you smoke more now? Yeah. The young man we're talking to spends a lot of time just sitting and listening to music. Keith is 16. He's been a daily marijuana user for more than a year. Now his friends call him burned out. Being burned out, that's just, you don't get high when you smoke it, or you're, you just acting kind of really dumb, you know, somebody that will talk to you and you're not, you don't hear them or you don't pay attention to them. That's when people start calling you burn out. You have trouble with your memory? Yeah, you forget what you're saying. Who told you you were burned out, and why did they tell you that? Uh, just my friends clowning around, you know, they're saying, oh, you're burned out, you know. What were you doing that made them say that? Uh, they'd, be, they'd be talking to me, and I'm just not paying attention, and not realizing that they were talking to me. I've seen this, too, and uh, it's entirely possible that the youngsters who smoke lots of good pot over long periods of time, sustain some mental impairment which is not completely reversible. It may go on for months, and there is a suspicion that it may, some of it may be permanent, so that they're not as keen, as sharp, as they were previously. This may not be perceived by the youngster. I say, hey, burnout, you know, we're talking to you. But I don't consider myself ever being burnt out. I don't know, you know, they may, say that I am, but I don't. Have you ever seen other people who you think are burnt out who don't think they're burnt out themselves? Yeah, I do. When I smoke by myself, I, I just think about things. And, you know, you can just think about things that you don't think about when you're not smoking it. Just not anything particular, just anything, really. You can just, you're not bored because you you kind of like got something to do. You know, you're thinking, or you're, you're just doing something. But you're sitting still. Yeah. And you don't, you don't think to yourself that you're, you're sitting still not doing anything. You're sitting still thinking about things. And you don't think to yourself that you're bored. At least I don't, anyway. Have you d ever done anything when you were really stoned that you were really proud of, you know, put a bike together or anything like that, or is it mostly just sitting when you are stoned? Hmm. Well, I may have done it, but I don't really remember it, you know, just nothing that's really important. When I'm, when I'm stoned, I just like sitting back and just listen to music mostly. That's what I like doing when I'm high. But if you stay stoned most of the time, that means that's what you do most of the time. Yeah. I don't know what parents can do because I've tried everything. I know I've asked, I've read, I've studied, I've prayed. 
I'm still looking for an answer. I'm not going to give up hope because I am that fearful of it. Um, I'm afraid that the effects will be very major. And it's going to be found out at a point of no return as far as the youngsters that are engaged now in it. Basically, a, per a young person who is chronically stoned is not coping with the important tasks of growing up. Uh, he is going to be diverted from the normal growth and is going to find himself further and further behind his, uh, his peers. Kids don't think about their future because they don't... This young man is a member of an organization called Pot Smokers Anonymous. He quit marijuana when he began to see the effects of chronic smoking on his own life. I was getting a little lazy. And I figured that sooner or later I was going to get burnt. I was going to have the burnout feeling, as you said. And then sooner or later, I was just going to be totally wasted. And I didn't want to be it that way. I want to make something of myself. Well, some of them will stop, I would hope, and, and uh, recoup. Others who continue to use this good material and can continue over many years, may be so impaired that they will never function at their best level of effectiveness. Keith Strupp is the Washington lobbyist for Normal, the national organization for the reform of marijuana laws. He'll soon be leaving Normal, but in the past eight years, he's done a great deal to make America more tolerant of marijuana use by adults. Keith Strupp believes that the use of marijuana should be restricted to adults. He's worried about the increase in chronic marijuana smoking among young people. There is a tendency on the part of young people today to underestimate the potential for harm from psychoactive drug use, I think. Um, I would caution them against this. There is no such thing as a totally safe drug, and I don't think marijuana is going to be the first. It should obviously not be a daily habit, and in particular, it should not be something people do before they attend school or before they study for exams or things like that. In the White House and other key government positions, Dr. Robert DuPont also helped to liberalize American attitudes toward marijuana. Now in private practice, he has had second thoughts. In the past, you've said publicly that marijuana is less of a hazard to health than tobacco or alcohol. Why have you changed your mind? for two reasons. One is we know a lot more about the health hazards of marijuana now uh, and how dangerous it really is. But two, and equally important, is that I now realize that this has been interpreted by the public as meaning marijuana is okay. We're so used to alcohol and tobacco that we assume if marijuana is no worse, then why not get used to marijuana? That is a disaster, and I feel very badly to have contributed to that. Just as for 20 or 30 or 40 years, people oversimplified and exaggerated the dangers that might be present from smoking marijuana, uh, I think there is a tendency today, especially among young people, uh, to assume the other direction, that uh, because marijuana isn't a killer drug, that therefore it's totally harmless, or in some cases they actually believe it's a panacea. Marijuana is no panacea, but like any other drug, it does have potential medical applications. For example, it's believed to be useful in treating certain kinds of glaucoma. And here at the National Institutes of Health, it's being tested as a means of relieving the agonizing side effects of chemotherapy in some cancer victims. And there are other current experiments. But all of them are just that, experiments to determine whether marijuana, or in some cases THC alone, can help the victims of serious disease. The problem is that by the time news of these experiments reaches the schoolyard, the information has become garbled. Some of the children we spoke to were convinced that marijuana had been proven to be a safe medicine for asthma, cataracts, even cancer, and that marijuana was not merely harmless, but beneficial, like vitamin pills. And a lot of people think if they smoked, and their lungs would be all right, and they don't think it's something bad for you. I heard that it helped your lungs, as a matter of fact. That's why I thought it's kind of good to smoke it. Well, I know where this uh, myth starts. It starts in, in, at UCLA, where we um, studied this problem and did find that THC, even marijuana, will dilate the bronchial tubes. Now, unfortunately, marijuana is not good medicine for asthma because it has so many irritants in it. With cancer, there's another confusion. Marijuana is used for people who have 
cancer and who are getting cancer chemotherapy and have nausea and vomiting because of the cancer chemotherapeutic drugs. And marijuana does reduce the nausea and vomiting. It has nothing to do with cancer whatsoever. The very same people who think marijuana is harmless think it is a therapeutic agent. Well, the only reason it could possibly be a therapeutic agent is because it's a very powerful chemical. If it weren't doing anything in the body, it wouldn't be potentially useful uh, for a therapy. Most of our knowledge about the chemicals in marijuana comes from these plants. This field is part of a government research project at the University of Mississippi. The director, Dr. Carlton Turner, supervises the cultivation of the marijuana for scientific research. He also analyzes the chemical content of marijuana seized on the streets. He's worried about the presence of carcinogens, that is, known cancer-causing agents, in marijuana smoke. Because pot users smoke less than tobacco users, they have generally assumed that there is no risk of lung cancer from marijuana smoking. But with the quantities of potent marijuana that today's young chronic smokers are consuming, Dr. Turner thinks there is a risk. I would say that there's more tar in a cannabis cigarette than there will be in a tobacco cigarette. And the tar here is of a different chemical composition. Some of the chemicals that you find in tobacco smoke, you also find here. In fact, you have more carcinogenic compounds in the smoke from a cannabis cigarette than you do from a single tobacco cigarette of the same size. Most young people already know that the tar in tobacco smoke contains carcinogens, which can cause cancer. But many do not know that research has shown even more carcinogens in the tar from marijuana smoke. The plain fact is that the chemicals are there uh, that do cause cancer, and we know that, and we ought to get that message out, that that is a serious problem and a major threat. Remember that marijuana is kept in the lungs for a long time, much longer than tobacco smoke. It gets way down into the small bronchi, and it's entirely possible that, since it does contain coal tars, that it's a possible cause of cancer. Considerations of cancer aside, is it possible to compare the effect of a marijuana cigarette on the lungs with the effect of a cigarette made of tobacco? Yes. In our study at UCLA, Dr. Tashkin found that five marijuana joints had the same effect as smoking 112 tobacco cigarettes. Dr. Tashkin's study was the first direct comparison of the effects of marijuana smoke and tobacco smoke on the human lungs. It showed that one marijuana joint produced the same amount of lung inflammation as more than a pack of cigarettes. That lung inflammation shrinks the air passages, making it more difficult to breathe. So the effect on a child's lungs from five joints a week is the same as smoking more than five packs of cigarettes a week. Let's talk about you, Mr. Strupp. You gave up cigarettes, tobacco, years ago. Almost 10 years ago, right. You've smoked marijuana daily for about 10 years. Correct. You have bronchitis. Or at least I, I seem to cough in the mornings, right. Uh, you cough in the morning sufficiently to make you think you'd better go have a checkup. That's correct. Well, um, you know, I'm no different, I suppose, than uh, alcohol drinkers or cigarette smokers at times. I, I've never known a cigarette smoker yet who didn't occasionally say he was going to quit and occasionally curse the day that they started as they were coughing in the morning, etc. I feel a little of that. I mean, I think uh, marijuana smoking uh, on a daily basis is almost bound to cause some complications in your lungs because you are bringing in smoke into your lungs, and I doubt that that's healthy. Uh, I've noticed myself in the last year in particular, I seem to, to cough in the mornings very much like a cigarette smoker. You just get joint like this. Another person comes up to you. And they blow on that and blow all the smoke right into your lungs? And you can take it through the nose, too. Really? What does that do for you? Uh, you cop a super rush, because it's, it's a lot bigger than a toke. And are all the kids doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, some of the younger ones, you know, don't know how yet or are scared to fact of the seeds popping in your mouth, uh, the fire falling down. Some joints tend to run, you know, mm. and the fire can go in your mouth, and it hurts. <laughs>
taking a substance, a, a smoke, inhaling it, and unlike a cigarette smoke, uh, the person purposefully inhales very deeply and then holds it to get the maximum exposure to the deepest part of the lungs. Well, this is a disaster uh, in terms of, of health consequences. Uh, I don't think it's possible to bring a foreign substance into your lungs uh, as you do with marijuana and expect that if you use enough of it over a long period of time that you're not going to have some ill effects. I think you will. But there is a more immediate effect to marijuana use, intoxication. Now this device attaches to an automobile dashboard so a driver can toke marijuana while he travels the highway. I'm using pipe tobacco, by the way. The popularity of a gadget like this is another example of how misinformed some of our young people are on the intoxicating effects of marijuana. They have been educated about the dangers of mixing alcohol and driving, but many still cling to the notion that marijuana is different and safe. But tests at the Southern California Research Institute have shown that marijuana severely impairs a driver's perception, concentration, reaction time, and overall driving skill. The tests show that the decrease in driving ability is directly related to the amount of marijuana smoked. They also show that this impairment of driving ability persists for several hours, even after the marijuana smoker no longer feels high. But again, the facts about what this can mean on the highway have not reached many of our young people. Well, I think anything that you can do when you're straight, you can do when you're high. Including driving a car? Including driving a car. On marijuana, you hardly ever hear any car accidents on marijuana, because you always know what you're doing. For whatever reason, alcohol drinkers for a long time used to claim that they could get drunk and drive all right. It seemed to them they drove all right, even though they ran into the rest of us, and a lot of other people knew all, the t all along they couldn't drive well. Well, marijuana smokers, I'm afraid, have fallen for that same line of self-congratulatory. Uh, they've, they've generally told each other, hey, man, I can smoke the best marijuana in the world and drive, and it's not like alcohol. It's okay. Well, that's simply not true. It is a major source of, of death of injury, of property loss in the country right now because of drivers uh, stoned on marijuana. Let me make it clear that the research is now convincing that you should not smoke marijuana and drive an automobile, period. Whether you're a, an adult or a juvenile doesn't make any difference. Why isn't this information available to young marijuana smokers? Just because of our uh, worrying about uh, having every I dotted and every T crossed. We're not saying it clearly, but the evidence is there. You'll go into health class and um, the, there's about maybe a three page thing on drug abuse and drugs, and it just says marijuana, mild hallucinogen, and that's just about it. Would it be fair to say, Dr. Cohen, that the young people in the United States who are now using marijuana regularly are in effect the guinea pigs in an experiment on a national scale? Well, they're certainly doing things to themselves that we, as researchers, wouldn't do or wouldn't be allowed to do. So, yes, they are guinea pigs. We are learning uh, some of the um, unhappy sides of marijuana from them. They're making themselves guinea pigs. There's no doubt about it. They are skating on the thinnest of thin ice, uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, a hope that they have that they're not. Uh, running a very severe health hazard, uh, health risk, uh, I think uh, they're going to lose their bets. Besides the potential health consequences for the chronic smoker, there's another aspect of the growing use of marijuana by the young. Those four million juveniles who use marijuana, even if they merely experiment with it or use it occasionally, have one thing in common. They are breaking the law. In a legal sense, at least, they have become a generation of outlaws. They're on the receiving end of a vast criminal network of marijuana growers, smugglers, and distributors. In many cases, our children are part of that criminal network. It begins here, in the marijuana fields of Colombia, the major source of supply for America's multi-billion dollar marijuana industry. Officially, marijuana cultivation is illegal in Colombia. But in fact, there is 10 times more marijuana grown in Colombia today than there was just five years ago. Nearly all of it is destined for the United States. Most of it leaves Colombia from the northern Guajira Peninsula, 
From there, a steady stream of freighters, fishing boats, even yachts carries it to delivery points all along the United States coastline. In addition, aircraft leave the Guajira regularly, smuggling tons of marijuana as far north as Chicago. Obviously, when you're talking about ships bringing in 20 or 30 tons of marijuana at a time, you're not talking about a, a group of college kids that are off on a lark at spring vacation. You're talking about a syndicate, organized crime. It may not be the mafioso, but it's certainly organized crime, dealing in millions of dollars. Sometimes violence, it's a culture that none of us are very proud of. A charter member of that culture is pilot Robert Eby, now in prison. Last year, Robert Eby was arrested when his DC-4, loaded with Colombian marijuana, became stuck in the mud at an airport in Virginia. Before that, he'd made 30 smuggling flights, penetrating the American air defense system each time. Coming back to the United States, you listen on the radio for uh, flight plans to be filed. And coming out of the Bahamas and out of a lot of Latin American countries, there's no uh, telephones or uh, facility file flight plan other than by the, when you get in the air, then you file it over the radio. You listen for somebody to file a flight plan. Uh, and being you're in a faster aircraft, say a DC-4 over 172, you uh, try to catch up to where he's at. And before he penetrates, you're on his tail about uh, 30 feet behind him. So you piggyback on another plane. Piggyback on another airplane. And there's somebody that doesn't even aware that you're even there. If he'd ever look behind him and see he's being, about to be eaten up by a big airplane, he'd probably uh, have a heart attack. Today, the bulk of the incoming marijuana is hauled by freighters like this one. They make offshore deliveries to Americans who smuggle it to distributors' warehouses. There is so much coming in that marijuana literally washes ashore on some Florida beaches. The fact is that despite the best efforts of the American government, this country is being flooded with marijuana. If you just look throughout the country marijuana is pervasive it's all over at every social level throughout the country we have made some significant cases we're continuing to investigate other cases however the flow is just so enormous that we are inundated i don't really have to go out and find it it's just somebody comes up and say hey you want to smoke one they it finds you more or less than you find it if you got the money you can get the quality to match it because I know you can get, all right, green pot is supposedly the worst. Now, don't get me wrong, there's very good green pot also. And then there's gold, which is usually always good. Now, the gold will cost you more than the bad stuff. But if you have the money, you can get just about anything. We can't essentially deal with the problems of the black market, uh, problems like age controls and quality controls and strength controls. You can't begin to address those problems until you first eliminate the black market and offer a regulated legal market. I wouldn't recommend that now. It's true we have uh, some, what should we call them, recreational drugs now that are legal and that we wish would go away. But that doesn't mean that we ought to add marijuana to that list. Do you think marijuana should be legalized? Yeah. If I was president, I'd have done had it legalized a long time ago. Because there ain't nothing wrong with it. What would be the big advantages of legalization? Well, then they'd be, then people in the store, you'd probably be able to just walk in the store and get a pack of joints, you know, like cigarettes. And then they'd have different brands, I guess, you know, Colombia, Mexican, whatever you want. Our experience with alcohol and tobacco is so bad uh, that to think about that as precedent, as a precedent for uh, dealing with marijuana is just, to me, an unthinkable idea. That debate over legalization has been going on for a long time. While it has, many American schoolyards have become retail outlets for the marijuana industry. In a recent Gallup poll, 81% of American high school students said that marijuana was easy or fairly easy to obtain. Nearly 60% of junior high school students said the same thing. And some children are not just buying reefer, they're selling it. Often they are chronic smokers who deal in order to finance their own marijuana habits. They usually are selling joints at the bus stop or bags, whatever. Um, during lunch, after school. Well, once you get a bag, you just roll up joints and sell them. You get your money back, and then you keep what's left over. 
And usually when you start, you buy a quarter pound, which is four ounces. And that goes for anywhere between 100 and 150. But usually it's about 125. So then you take three of those ounces, and you sell them for about 45 a piece, and then you make about $10 and an ounce for your head. That's for your own use? Yeah, for my own use. It's just my terms. Are a lot of kids dealing? Not a lot, but I'd say enough. Enough to supply the whole entire school. If they arrested everybody that had some, they'd be arresting just about everybody. Everybody that's, you know, about 13 on up. To cut down on arrests, some states, like Alaska, have passed decriminalization laws. Basically, this makes the possession of small amounts of marijuana a minor offense with no jail term or criminal record involved. So far, 11 states have passed such laws. Some people think that's a step in the right direction. Others think that this relaxing of the rules for adult smokers has further confused young people on the subject of marijuana. When you were in the government, Dr. DuPont, you were one of the first policymakers to advocate that criminal penalties be removed for the possession of a certain amount, a small amount of marijuana. Uh, do you think there's a connection between the growing acceptance of that, of decriminalization, and the increase in the number of young marijuana users? I do, and I think it's tragic. Uh, it relates to the fact that uh, for most people, they can only think about an issue in black and white terms. They see support for uh, a fine as opposed to a prison sentence for marijuana possession as being pro-pot. The public, the policy makers, everybody is still way too confused about marijuana. We're not giving clear messages to young people, to anybody about marijuana yet, and then we've got to change that. What is the clear message you would give? That marijuana is a dangerous drug. I think our obligation is to convince people that even if marijuana is dangerous to use, it's not a criminal justice problem. And those who use it should be provided with good information. We should try to convince them that it's not in their best interest to endanger their own health, but we should not confuse them with criminals. The drug problem is filled with many unpleasant realities. There's none more unpleasant, more painful, or more surprising than the large number of young people who are using marijuana every day and whose lives are affected, distorted, uh, and harmed in many, many ways. What would it take to convince you to stop? Well, if I heard something was bad, like it could kill you or make you real sick or something like that, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't smoke it. <clears throat> what should our society do about a 12-year-old who smokes marijuana daily? Before we can do anything, we must recognize that Brian and hundreds of thousands like him are a new and special problem. Up to now, our national debate has concerned itself mainly with the occasional use of marijuana by adults. That debate is not likely to end soon. But our children cannot wait. We have to tell them something now. Admittedly, there are still some important things that we don't know about the long-term effects of chronic marijuana use on the human body, especially on children. But in the meantime, our children are not being given the knowledge that is available now. They've not been told that the marijuana they are smoking is 10 times as potent as the stuff that college students were using five years ago. They've not been told about the cancer-causing elements in marijuana smoke. Many of them don't even realize that marijuana makes it dangerous to drive a car. It is not the children's fault that they don't know these things. It is the fault of our government, of our schools, of all of us. Um, deal for it. I like when I get up in the morning, I like to smoke one, or after I eat, I kind of like to smoke one then, or, or just when there's a bunch of people around, that's when I really like to smoke pot. What effect do you think smoking marijuana has on your work at school? Not too good of effect, because when you smoke marijuana, it just you just don't feel like doing work right then. You don't feel like even getting into it at all, listening or nothing. It just makes it seem like a drag. It makes you feel like you're in a dream. It's not normal, and it's not 
too active. You're just in between, just right. Brian lives in Florida, but there are children like Brian in almost every American city. Children who, even before they enter high school, have become veteran marijuana users. How old were you when you started? Suddenly, in just the past few years, hundreds of thousands of American youngsters have become daily marijuana smokers. Not experimenters, not occasional users, but chronic smokers. In their own words, potheads. They smoke not just at weekend rock concerts. They smoke every day. And not just teenagers, but children. They are smoking reefer with a frequency and in ways that are potentially disastrous. How many joints I was smoking was about 100 a week. 100 joints a week? Mm -hmm. It's about 10 a day, a little more. And usually a large group that I know that I'm friendly with smokes in the morning, smokes in the afternoon, and smokes at night. And any time in between there, too. To support a habit, this extensive, where do these kids get the money? They work for it. Some take it from their bar mitts for a confirmation money. So All of them. About 20% don't. What grade are you going to be in this year? Eighth. Like most of the children you will meet in this report, Brian lives in a pleasant neighborhood. He is not a deprived child. He is not a delinquent. He does not like alcohol, tobacco, or PCP. Smoking marijuana, toking, they call it, is what he and his friends prefer. And their entire lives have come to revolve around what they call copping a buzz. How many joints do you smoke a day? Around five. Five. Sometimes more, because sometimes, like, there's a party Friday night or something, we just smoke almost our whole bag, say. When you say you smoke five joints, by yourself? No, with friends, like just friends of mine. How many joints does it take you to get high? Started smoking regular. About eight and a half, nine. How often do you uh, get stoned? Almost every day. How does it make you feel? Good. I just feel relaxed, you know. Just like to sit there and watch TV or do something. Could you tell us about your smoking habits? When do you light up your first joint? Well, on the weekends when I first get up after a while, I just smoke a couple joints to get off, and then I just wait a while, and then after I've gone down and I smoke some more. And on weekdays, I usually don't smoke in the morning, but sometimes I buy a couple of joints and go up to the bus stop, and we match each other. But it's usually I just wait till after school and come home and get high with my brother and stuff. Uh, do many of your friends smoke at school? Yeah, almost all. Reading, writing, and reefer. Well, I was walking home, and a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to go smoke a joint, so I said, yeah, and we went over to his house and smoked a joint. What'd you do after that? Then we had decided to come over here, but it was raining, so we just waited till it stopped, and then we came over here, and he smoked a joint with me and my brother. You still high? Yeah, a little. Feel good? Yeah. A 12-year-old schoolboy stoned on reefer, marijuana. For years, we have debated the legal and medical ramifications of marijuana smoking. But for the most part, we've talked about adults. All our medical research has been done on adults. This report is not about adults, and it is not about the occasional use of marijuana. It is about chronic marijuana smoking by American youngsters.